Let me tell you a story that some of you have already experienced. You come by a local mom's and pop's grocery store. It's on the corner of your street. You have a list of groceries, you grab them. You can't seem to find your favorite cheese though. There are lots of other brands, but you are not feeling adventurous today. So you head to the counter. And then the store owner, she goes, I remember that Emmental cheese you enjoyed last time. You took the French one, but we have a fresh supply of two Swiss brands. One is a bit spicier, but I really believe you must try it. I bet you'll love it. Now you don't even remember her name, but she knows which cheese you like. Can you resist the temptation? Hi, my name is Kirill Stadi, a Managing Director for Data and Analytics at Alticsoft. And today we'll talk about personalization and how to approach it with AI. Well, the happy ending to this absolutely real story is that you buy the cheese, right? Here I see three takeaways. First, it wasn't Amazon or Netflix who invented personalization. This cheese story could have happened a century ago and the bits would be the same. Personalization is not only about technology, it's how you approach your customer. So what does this grocery store owner do right? Remember, there are many brands, but you hesitate to experiment and the variety paralyzes you. So you give up and you decide to spend the night without your favorite cheese. This behavior is actually backed up by a lot of research. Perhaps the most famous one is the GEM study. In the year 2000, two psychologists from Columbia and Stanford ran an experiment, allowing shoppers at a grocery store to sample 24 types of GEM on the first session and only 6 on the second. Guess what? People who faced a smaller variety of choices were 10 times more likely to buy the GEM. And dozens of other choice studies have confirmed these results. Let it sink in 10 times. And here we are in 2022. There are about 700 types of maple syrup on Amazon. You may have a couple favorite ones, no problem there. But that's not always the case. Imagine finding yourself in your kid's room. You see them playing a console or PC and you ask them, are you winning, son? And you think to yourself that it would be great to present a game on Christmas. I have bad news for you. There are about 50,000 games on Steam alone. The internet, e-commerce are great inventions. They give us the choice, the 700 types of maple syrup to choose from, but they can easily paralyze our ability to make decisions. So you can't get along without it. You have to narrow down the choice to three, four best options. And the third takeaway is people crave a personal approach. They like to be recognized. They actually like to know that they are recognized. The coolest thing about Blockbuster was that guy at the local store who knew you. He could always recommend the next movie you must watch, and you actually trusted him. He knew your tastes, he spoke your language. Netflix, that outplayed Blockbuster by the way, will try to tell you why they are recommending The Big Lebowski. Cause you added Fargo to your list, right? And 70% of consumers want to receive recommendations that are meaningful and are based on their preferences. The best experience is the one crafted, tailored to an individual. That's what a local grocery store can afford, but global digital business, well, not so much. What we can do, though, is show that we do recognize the person and differ them from the rest. We can make personal discounts, we can make birthday presents, and we can communicate that to a customer explicitly. Let's recap. There are two pillars of a great experience. First, you narrow down the options to three or four products of a similar type. You want your customers to have a choice, but you don't want to overwhelm and paralyze them. Second, you talk the customer's language and you let the customers know that you care specifically about them. You recognize their personality. And finally, personalization existed in one form or another for decades. So let's talk about how it's done and how it changes. A common approach in the past was to gather information on users, generalize this data and try to segment them, try to find similarities and differences in groups of customers. Even today, we keep targeting millennials, they don't look like Gen Zs. Or check the preferences of families with children and compare them to young couples. Segmentation is still a big thing, it approximates our customer personas. But frankly, segmenting isn't personalizing just yet. Yes, you can narrow down the options, 
but you can't deliver a truly tailored experience. You can't recognize the unique qualities of each individual customer. Things have changed with machine learning. This technology lets us make truly personalized offers, those that target a single person. Some call it hyper-personalization. These systems create profile for each user to learn either preferred product features or try to see similarities between this person and other people. Which tastes do they have in common? Can we recommend similar products to them? At this point, I suggest you check the video series of my colleague, Alex, who explains the technical sides of personalization and recommender systems. The link will be right here. That said, how does that work in practice? What do we have now and how will personalization look in the future? There are many great examples of personalization out there. What comes to mind first are obviously Amazon and Netflix. These two companies pioneered digital personalization. They first did that at scale. Amazon, for instance, tracks all types of user behavior data, from product views to the way you check out. And then it combines this data with external sources. This allows Amazon to stay aware of your preferences, but also put them into context. Say, it can recognize you're looking for electronics. But not only that, it can also tell that you want to make a gift to your tech-savvy dad for the upcoming Father's Day. And Amazon employs dozens of personalization strategies, including social proof, subsequent purchases, and many more. Another tech powerhouse, the icon of successful recommenders, is Netflix. Their movie recommender algorithm is the crown jewel of the whole platform. But few people know that personalization at Netflix doesn't stop here. Not only do they suggest movies, but they also personalize types of movie shelves and the order of these shelves. They even personalize thumbnails that you see. Large travel platforms like Booking.com or Expedia also do great personalization. They can send emails with tailored offers or configured travel packages. But one thing that travel brands successfully pioneered is how to be sensitive to the current customer circumstances. What is important to my customer right now? Do you remember that Amazon can include upcoming holidays? When it comes to travel, you must always be aware of trip's purpose. The same family guy who likes lazing around near the pool may soon become a dynamic business traveler. He seeks some fast weekend activities after spending several days at the work meetings. And travel platforms learn to recognize those needs by combining data from previous trips and the current behavior, the way this particular person looks for their trip now. Another industry that discovers personalization is insurance. Success stories here aren't that pronounced, but still look impressive. Vitality, an insurance company, suggests its clients track their health stats with variables like Apple Watch. Vitality then gathers these results, and if you stay healthy and exercise, you can earn extra rewards that go along with your insurance plan. So this is where we are now. What should we expect in the future? Today, personalization is a set of different, usually separate strategies that work on a touchpoint level. You open Airbnb and you see several widgets with different value propositions. And the content of some of those widgets adjusts depending on, well, you. Now, imagine that you book flights using your airline app, let's say United. Once you're done, Airbnb sends you a couple of accommodation options. It knows your destination and dates, so it makes an informed guess that you aren't going for a business trip. It suggests accommodation options in your price range and follows your tastes when it chooses rooms. After you land and when you approach the apartment, a tour app suggests local restaurants with vegetarian options because you're a vegetarian. It can make a table reservation in advance so you'll have a meal once you arrive. Do you get the idea? McKinsey suggests that we'll move from isolated touch points to a more integrated ecosystem. Different brands can communicate with each other to unite the customer journey make it rich and truly unique. Another change that we should expect soon is that personalization will go beyond digital experiences. In one of the early trailers to the game Cyberpunk 2077, developers showed how street ads change depending on who is looking. And the internal navigation system showed the closest place where you can buy the product you have just seen on the ad. This feature didn't make it to the game, but it can make it to our reality. Imagine that a grocery store app tells you that an imported beer you like is back in stock. And it does so right when you are entering the store, and even helps navigate to the exact shelf. It doesn't spam you randomly. These are two major changes we expect. And, as usual, I'll finish with some recommendations. So how to approach hyper-personalization? 
First, start tracking user behavior and interactions. Log activity, use attention maps, track how they navigate your website or mobile app. Pay attention to interrupted actions, like abandoned cards. Try to gather as much data as possible. You may get a hand on external data as well. If they log in with Facebook, you can check publicly available details. One thing to keep in mind, don't be creepy. Explain to people what you track and why you do that. Be open about that. Obviously, you have to keep customer data secure. Before you start any login, run a security audit. Invest in personal data protection. Another important step is to build a solid data platform. You must have a flexible infrastructure to store, process and visualize data. You can learn more about how such platforms work in our explainer video. At this point, maybe you don't have machine learning algorithms yet, but you already can try segmentation and other conventional methods like people also buy or things bought together. Besides data engineers who work on the data platform, engage data scientists. Personalization is a research and development initiative. They'll have to look at your data and try to build some proof of concept. Possibly, they'll suggest some new types of records for you to collect. Once you have working prototypes of algorithms, run A-B tests on a subset of your customers. Try different approaches and iterate. All machine learning products are living organisms. You have to update the training data. You have to experiment with new models. Be ready to iterate on your data platform. It's a continuous process. And if you do it right, you should expect the results. BCG estimates that no matter your industry, personalization brings 6-10% to of revenue growth. Ok, that's it for today. Tell me about your experience with personalization in the comment section below. Like the video, subscribe and see you next time. We'll talk about demand forecasting. Stay tuned.